Good morning, everybody. I think we're getting ready to start our program. My name is Lierka Miller, and I am the chair of the Board of Associates for the Whitehead Institute here in New York. I am delighted to welcome you. I love seeing this full room. Um, so whether you're brand new to Whitehead or you have attended every single event in the last several years, I promise you, you are definitely in for a treat. So delighted to have you. We have two important topics today. So the first one is cancer. Cancer touches all of us. When I was introduced to Whitehead Institute for the very first time, the topic of the day was cancer. This was at Letty Gotchberg's house, and Bob Weinberg was speaking. And he spoke about cancer stem cells, particularly in breast cancer, and I was absolutely blown away. I was sitting there mesmerized, and I said, this is amazing. So he was done speaking, my hand was up. And I said, Dr. Weinberg, this is fascinating stuff. Can you please tell me how this translates into the clinic? So Bob kind of, sort of, softly dodged that question and said something, I don't remember what, and then he took other questions in the room. And I'm sitting there, not really fuming, but a, a bit annoyed. And my hand goes up again, because I'm like that. And I said, please, I didn't quite get the answer. Can you tell me how what you just presented translates into treatment for patients? And that was when he inhaled, he exhaled. He probably thought this woman is not gonna give up. But he explained to me the value of basic research. And that was when I got it for the first time. And that was when I became a supporter of Whitehead Institute. And I'm a proud supporter to this day. Because one of the main hallmarks of Whitehead Institute is the ability to do unfettered research, a quest for answers of basic biology. This affects all diseases. This affects all of us. So I am delighted that that topic will also be covered today uh, because that is at the core of everything that Whitehead stands for. So without further ado, I would like to introduce the director of Whitehead Institute, Dr. David Page. Now, David Page is an MD, PhD, first Whitehead Fellow ever, a member of the National Academy of Sciences, um, an investigator of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. I think I have three index cards with David's credentials alone. Winner of many prizes, uh, March of Dimes, uh, the MacArthur, woohoo! But the main claim to fame is this. David was interviewed by Stephen Colbert. He was on the Colbert Report. And he was there defending the honor of the Y chromosome. So that's what the most important thing about David Page. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Laerka, for that very kind introduction. And uh, I also want to say thank you, Laerka, for everything that you do to help support Whitehead Institute. Deep, my deep thanks, gratitude to you and to your committee uh, here for putting together this terrific event. Thank you very much. So here it is, May 1st. Um, May 1st has become synonymous with the Whitehead Symposium. And when the snow melts in Boston, we venture out and we come to New York City. So it's a pleasure to be here and to see so many old friends and new friends in the audience. We have a very special day planned for you, um, a day that signifies the essence of what makes Whitehead Institute an extraordinary place 
to do science, a place where the world's most ambitious and curious scientific minds have the freedom to ask and answer the most important questions in biology, questions that will undoubtedly change the future of human health. Now, it turns out that Whitehead Institute was the brainchild of Jack Whitehead. Jack, who's pictured here in the center with uh, the bearded founding director, David Baltimore. Jack was an inventor by trade and by nature. He wanted to create a new model for life sciences research. And Jack's founding vision was a bold one. The experiment was grand. The idea was to amass a peerless concentration of scientific talent under one roof and catalyze it with the resources and the freedom to blaze new trails. And the results have been profound. We're now 33 years into this experiment. Countless breakthroughs that have transformed our fundamental understanding of biology uh, and disease. Yet the full measure of Whitehead's impact extends beyond scientific discovery. Whitehead laboratories shape new generations of scientific leaders uh, who, uh, while Whitehead scientists create vital intellectual capital in the form of companies, technologies, and strategies for leading public and private scientific institutions. So let me say this again. We are about discovery, but as um, many of you in this audience know, we devote ourselves to training and creating the next generation of leaders, and we, and we translate our findings uh, in the uh, commercial and healthcare uh, sector. So to tell you a little bit more about today's Whitehead Laboratories, they are led by uh, <clears throat> 17 distinguished faculty members, in addition, four fellows, Whitehead Fellows are a special group of young investigators who come to us right after graduate school or medical school, and they're given the opportunity to bypass the conventional phase of postdoctoral training and immediately run their own independent show, immediately create independent research agendas. And these laboratories of the 17 faculty and the four fellows are populated by over 300 trainees who come to us as undergraduates, as graduate students, and as postdoctoral fellows. And it is this multi-generational community of scientists and scholars who are quite literally doing the research that will change the way that you, your children, and your grandchildren experience health and disease. And our faculty are recognized around the world as scientific leaders. I'm going to give you three measures that have no peer elsewhere in the biomedical research enterprise. Three of our 17 faculty have been awarded the National Medal of Science bestowed by the President of the United States. It's our nation's science, uh, highest scientific honor. Of our 17 faculty, five are Howard Hughes Medical Institute investigators and nine are members of the National Academy of Sciences. Again, these are ratios without equal in the scientific community. Now, as some of you know, I came to Whitehead in 1984. Um, I was six, uh, six weeks out of uh, medical school, and I was all of 28 years old, and I was somehow, I still can't figure out why, why the decision was taken, I was somehow given the opportunity to run my own laboratory at that point, and I have never left Whitehead. For good reason, there's no better place. I travel the world, many, many, I get to visit many biomedical research institutions, but there is no better place in the world to do curiosity-driven biological research. Time and again, Whitehead is at the top of the heap when you compare pound for pound, the strength of our scientific output. You compare it with that of any other institution in the world. Take, for example, the recent statistics released by the rating site uh, uh, Simago, which measures scientific impact based on the number of citations per paper published in top 
quality journal. So Whitehead was ranked number one in the world in the category excellence with leadership based on the impact of our scientific publications, which are our most, the most clear measure of our output. Now, in addition to publishing the most influential uh, scientific uh, discoveries in the world and serving as leaders of our fields, Whitehead scientists also develop the fundamental knowledge that leads to new therapies and cures. And so while we don't always boast about it, research at Whitehead has made an outsized contribution to our nation's biotech economy. Here is a list of some of the public and some of the private companies that were founded with the help of Whitehead faculty and Whitehead discoveries. And I'll now touch on just, I'll just give you a quick listing of a few of the therapies that had their roots in fundamental research conducted at Whitehead Institute. Among the therapies that emerged from research done at Whitehead are Herceptin for breast cancer treatment, <clears throat> Gleevec for the treatment of leukemia, Epigen for uh, treatment of, an, of uh, anemia, Tefamidus for the treatment of familial amyloid polyneuropathy, and Linzus for the treatment of irritable bowel syndrome. Now, today, you're going to hear about one particular scientific initiative, a bold new initiative at Whitehead Institute that will target, that is targeting the deadliest cancers. And this initiative brings together four Whitehead faculty members, Rick Young, David Sabatini, Bob Weinberg, Piyush Gupta, two of whom you'll be hearing from in just a, a short while. And this initiative embodies the spirit of Whitehead. We, we dare to tackle the most challenging questions in biology, the questions that others may shy away from, and we, we seek to make profound contributions to our understanding of health and disease. But before we dive into the presentations on this topic for the day, I want to pause for just a moment and thank all of you for what you do to support our work. You give generously, you make introductions on our behalf, and you spread the word about our pioneering research. These efforts, I, I can't emphasize the degree to which these efforts are more important today than ever before. Whitehead was founded on the premise that federal funding would cover 65% of our budget. That's, that was the case three decades ago. But as you well know, federal funding is in a, federal funding in support of basic biomedical uh, research is in a state of decline. I would call it a state of rapid retreat. Um, and we can no longer rely on, to, to the degree that we did, on this critical source of research dollars. So in 2004, when I became director, uh, federal support had dropped to 52% of our operating budget. And as of 2013, Federal funding at Whitehead had gone down to roughly 30%. Now, fortunately, we've been able to maintain our research volume during this time, but that is because we have been able to draw upon support from individuals like you and other streams of revenue to, ma to, maintain, this, uh, to maintain our activities in the face of this federal retreat. Now, as a, as a recent article in Forbes pointed out, Philanthropy serves the public good in ways that, frankly, that, that governments and corporations cannot. And this is especially true in this age when the federal government has turned away specifically from supporting the kind of curiosity-driven research that we know offers the surest path to new therapies and technologies of the future. So I'm grateful to each and every one of you, whether you're a BOA member who has been uh, traveling with us from the beginning, from the early days, or whether you're attending this symposium for the very first time. Thank you for everything you do and will do to help us remain at the leading edge of discovery. Now, we'll soon turn to the main program for the day, but I'm happy to take, at this point, 
just pause for a moment and take a few questions, if there are any. Now, again, I'm sure this is a very, this audience is comprised exclusively of shy, introverted individuals. And so I, when I, I, I know if I come to New York City, I will never receive any questions. But uh, anyway, so um, questions about um, the, that, that anyone might have at this point. Yes. Oh, we've got a mic coming over here for you. All right. Yeah, I think it was about a week ago there was an article in the Times about yeah. Luke Gingrich claiming that the NIH funds should be doubled. So I'm sure you found finally something to agree with him on. I have agreed with Newt Gingrich on almost everything in my, no. The, um, I, would, I would heartily second his, you know, actually thinking about um, the sort of state of the NIH budget um, and what it means for basic biomedical research. Let me, let me just give you, a, let me flesh that out a little bit more. 2003 was the year in which, in, adjusted for inflation, 2003 was the year in which federal support of biomedical research peaked. We've been on essentially a steady decline. We've now, since 2003, uh, federal purchasing power in biomedical research has, has declined by about 25 percent. Um, now, uh, uh, but it's not just that we have seen that 25% decline in federal research. We've seen a redirection of the available federal funds away from uh, curiosity-driven fundamental research into um, um, more explicitly translational and applied work. Now, you could say this makes great sense. And my colleagues, leaders at NIH say, this is what we must do to satisfy um, our, our politicians, our political leaders in Congress, this is what they are demanding and calling for, um, that we show results quickly. Um, but I think it, the record shows that that is a very short-sighted approach. <laughs> and of course, there are, we have lots of entities, corporate entities, that must be responsible to their shareholders in, in, on short time frames. But surely there must be a place in this whole enterprise <laughs> for institutions that take the long view. We take the long view, and we urge you to join us in taking the long view. Yeah. Yeah. Did you say something about what the NIH funding does we'll, to the... We'll get... Uh, <laughs> Lauren is, say, is nearing the birth of her, her child, and, and the microphone doesn't move quite as quickly as it used to, would right? You, <laughs> right? Would you say something about what the NIH funding does to the trajectory of young scientists in training and their view of the future? Okay, Jim raises an important question. I mean, I've just said that we, we pride ourselves at Whitehead on training the next generation of, of leaders, those who will um, carry forth. Um, well, I think your question answers itself. Um, the people we're training are brilliant. They're aware. They're paying attention. And um, we, of course, it, it, it is essential that there be some sort of sustainability and some perception, a perceived sustainability to our field so that we can continue to attract the very, very finest, uh, most driven and productive and creative individuals to train with us and then to go on and start their own laboratories elsewhere. So it is, um, it's, a real, it's a real source of concern, right? That, uh, uh, and I, I, what I would say is that the federal retreat, one of the biggest impacts of the federal retreat from the support of uh, fundamental biomedical research is that it, in, it can induce a kind of conservatism on the part of, uh, exist, of scientists who are already running laboratories. And I think what defines the Whitehead style of science is that we're, we do bold things. Um, many of us are in the process of, yet again, reinventing our laboratories 
and our research paths because we think that's the right thing to do. But it's especially challenging to reinvent um, uh, oneself scientifically and redirect the course of a laboratory um, uh, when the external forces are saying, be conservative, be conservative, um, deliver tomorrow. Um, so it's a, it's a great and important question you raised, Jim. Other questions? Okay. All right, thank you. I think we'll, um, uh, <clears throat> thank you for those questions. What I'd like to do now is um, introduce our first speaker of the morning, Hazel Siv. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Hazel, who will speak with us about the critical importance of basic research, the kind of research that lays the groundwork for discoveries that can revolutionize our understanding of health and disease. When she's not here at the New York Yacht Club, when she's back at Whitehead Institute, Hazel studies embryonic development and her research on the genetic basis of uh, proper formation, structurally speaking, of the brain has contributed to our understanding of birth defects and numerous developmental disorders. She's using the uniquely transparent zebrafish. You can see through it. Uh, this enables direct observation of the developing brain as a tool for identifying genes that may be associated with autism and other mental health disorders. Today, Hazel will share her thoughts regarding basic research and why it's so absolutely essential. Please join me in, in welcoming Hazel. Thank you, David. I'm going to dismantle you. Hey? David agrees I can dismantle him. Anytime. There. Thank you, Lauren. No. Well, good morning. If you were my class, you know I would do it again. <laughs> do it again? Okay, we'll do it. We'll do it. I always listen to my director. Good morning. Good morning. Actually, I never listen to my to director. This is the first time, right? It's just really a pleasure to be here with you, and thank you all so much for coming. It's it's such a pleasure to see old friends who have been with us on our research journey for a long time who've walked the difficult paths that I'll tell you about. And it's a pleasure to welcome those of you who we don't know so well and to tell you about who we are and what we do. David has already given you a background to the eminence of this institute that it's a real honor to be part of. And what I want to do is kind of set the stage for the cancer initiative that Rick and David are going to talk to you about the other David. Another David. We have many Davids at the Institute. It's the most popular name amongst the faculty. You can say David and you're kind of on safe ground that you're going to say something reasonable about one of them. Anyway, the, what I'm going to do is set the stage for what David Sabatini and Rick Young are going to tell you about the cancer initiative that we are putting together. So let's look at this, you know, cancer, the power of basic research, and let's focus down, you know, on some of the words that are there and talk about basic research and talk about its power. And what I 